Today, we're inviting you to listen to and question the voice of dissent from oligarchy. Uh, Heather Marsh is a political theorist with a revolutionary proposal for governance that she sets forth in her newly published book, Binding Chaos. She's also a human rights and internet activist, prominent blogger, and former editor of the WikiLeaks news outlet, WikiLeaks Central. We expect it will be very interesting and challenging to explore her proposal for mass collaboration. How do we accomplish the seeming oxymoron um, or built-in contradiction of binding and chaos? According to chaos theory, nature does it. How do we? Please help us welcome Heather Marsh by joining the conversation at 646-652-2235 at any time. Um, Heather, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> what is your mission and passion, Heather? My mission and passion, mm -hmm. one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, my mission and passion is to get us all working together in a more effective framework, um, technologically and on the ground. What methods of collaboration and communication are my mission and passion, really? Mm -hmm. And my goal is usually human rights and personal, personal fulfillment, safety, autonomy for people. Those are wonderful goals. <laughs> we really need to work for them for a better future. Yeah. What key experiences have uh, radicalized you? Oh, my entire life, Mary. It's hard to um, pinpoint what you do. Know, I think some people are just they have a lower tolerance for injustice, and I've seen it, you know, I can't remember a time when I wasn't infuriated by injustice. <laughs> when I was a toddler, I was. And, you know, I, I grew up in Canada's north, and I saw a great deal there that really needed modification. And the older you get, the more you see that systems that just aren't working for us anymore. It's interesting. I really liked your introduction because... Um, I tried, when I wrote Binding Chaos, I was really just trying to write a shorthand for people that I worked with, trying to explain, this is what I mean, um, in, in one spot, so I would stop having to repeat it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it turned into a whole series of articles, because people would say, well, what about this? What about this? Mm -hmm. And then I just chained them all together and, and put them in an, a book format. But um, it's really a very, very broad overview of a huge variety of things we're dealing with, and any one of those chapters could have easily been several books, <laughs> um, and, you know, should be, really. Um, but one of the things, I was trying to keep it as simple as I possibly could and explain it in a way that would be accepted by at least the people that I usually work with, if not mainstream. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, was, that I thought was intuitive, that was completely misunderstood, was the title. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's interesting because a lot of people take offense to the binding part and a lot of people take a part, offense to the chaos part and <laughs> <laughs> nobody really under, understood it the way I meant it when I said binding chaos. So um, I would like to explain that if you don't mind. Yes, please do. Uh, because for me, looking at systems, there's always a component of every system that we're dealing with that is fixed and it's a stable component that we're that we build on, at least for a certain period of time. And then there's the dynamic, chaotic portion of it where the change in the research and the adapting to different circumstances takes place. And, um, you know, like if you look at things like the education system when it became too rigid, there's alternative schools and homeschooling and things like that that develop new ideas and the ideas may not always be great, but they're the, they're the R and D portion of education, right? right? And we have you know naturopathic systems and, and various diversity for the medical system, in governance and in our justice systems, there is really no place for us to deal with the chaotic dynamic part of change. And um, for me, binding chaos, the term, it was really two things. One was the way we, our minds naturally bind chaos. We our minds are perfectly developed for accepting chaotic input and creating meaningful packets of information from them. We do it 
with every one of our senses. If, you know, if, if our eyes see the most extraordinary things and we take them, all that fractured input and we extrapolate based on what else we, our experiences told us and we try and create some meaningful packet from it, and we're wrong a huge amount of the time. I mean, our eyes are constantly seeing things that don't exist and every other sense. But, you know, we learn from experience. We throw out, you know, especially if you've had artist training or something like that, you, you've you been trained to um, interpret the chaos differently and see what is really there. And um, anyway, so for me, that was one form of binding chaos, how we naturally do it, how we take chaotic input and try to pull what's meaningful from it. And when it doesn't work, we iterate and learn and, um, you know, keep developing new models until something works for us. And the other was, of course, the way we've had this huge militarized coercive force clamp down on all of the chaotic dynamic portions of these systems to try and prevent any change from happening. And that is where you get the really um, the negative connotations of chaos, where it attempts to burst out of this Restraint, because chaos cannot be restrained at that force, and that's what we're seeing all over the world in systems of governance and, and justice. They're not adapted to change at all. They're archaic. They don't work, and the chaotic portion is bursting at the seams. It's interesting because I, I actually started a bit earlier because I, as part of the show, I'll, I'll do an article on, on our interview, but a lot of times I get into not just the interview but also some uh, – some dynamics through the world. So I get into this where I'm starting to get into writing about um, uh, chaos theory and, and basically I'm describing it as, as a place of infinite potential, which mm-hmm. from the powers that be uh, need to be suppressed because I mean, it could put them out of a job, you know? Um, so in other words, you know, chaos, chaos is dangerous in the, in that sense, but it's also, um, the mother of all uh, okay. of all potential. Of course. Mm. And, you know, I mean, that's what we've, we've, this has been going on for centuries that we yeah. have had this Apollonian ideal of structure and fixed rigidity and the Dionysians have just um, been suppressed and considered not, not a not stable influence and um, yeah, I, I don't think, I, I don't think a, a well, Apollonian and Dionysian is actually the right the right um, terms for them. I have, I have other goddesses that would be more, <laughs> goddesses of chaos that would be more appropriate probably, but these have been very, very suppressed in everything. We've been logic ahead of any kind of experimentation, rigid rules, regulations, licensing. You know, the more, the more forms of control we can layer on, the better, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, and the thing is that nature works on on chaos, on trying absolutely everything in one form or another, and what what thrives and succeeds um, propagates because mm-hmm. life and life and death and change is the nature of nature, um, and so chaos can be a beautiful thing, but we um, we tend to be indoctrinated that it's a very bad word. Yes, and, you know, I mean, chaos did not bring us devastation and destruction. It was the attempts to control it, right. in my opinion, that have. And, you know, the, uh, to me, the governments of the world have behaved in a manner equivalent to a person who destroys their entire house because there's a fly in it rather than simply opening the door or taking out the garbage. <laughs> yeah. That that makes sense, and uh, humanity has done that. And humanity, we we may either be in the process of or have already um, doomed ourselves because what we do when the we aren't in um, in sync with our environment, what we've been doing for the last several thousand years is technologically changing the environment Mm -hmm. rather than adapting to it. And Mm -hmm. I think we've stopped human evolution in its tracks and that we're going to pay a price for that, that 
all this time that we've been supposedly uh, advancing by changing the environment, what we really should have been doing is advancing by changing ourselves. By mm. I agree with you completely, Mary. I think we took a wrong turn. I mean, um, a lot of people introduce my work as radical ideas. To me, they're extremely traditionalist. I want um, my... And and my proposals aren't really my proposals, it also in my opinion. Um, you know, when people say, well, how would this work and how would you implement this? I wouldn't implement it. To me, I think all the ideas in that book are what would happen if you release the um, the highly coercive restraints that we've already got on the, on of all of our systems. But um, but yes, this this very rigid we will control everything idea, and we need some control and structure, but we also need to have the dynamic change part <laughs> yeah that's that's the uh, basic paradox of, of life isn't it mm-hmm. um you and speak of the oligarchy that results from almost all in fact from all of the ways that we have tried uh human governance can you clarify exactly what oligarchy is and why we've allowed it to continue for so long? Um, oligarchy is uh, the, what some people consider the natural tendency of power to create this um, hi- a hierarchy with somebody at the top. It will, the iron law of oligarchy, where it will always um, oligarchy will always occur. I don't believe that's actually true, but I believe that there is a force that needs to be accommodated and we need to, um, they said, we need to rewind our ideas for quite a few hundred years, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We we took a wrong turn. And this idea of a mesh network of equal people will every single time create an oligarchy. It has every single time we've tried it in democracy and communism and everything else. We need to recognize what's at play and start accommodating it with different structures. Uh, for me, back when we were, were transitioning out of feudalism, we had an opportunity for, to have autonomy, diversity, and society. And we had highly coercive forces at that time. Um, if, if you think of world politics as something emanating from Europe, at that time it would have been you know, the Roman Catholic Church and all, that, all those forces spreading out across empire. Um, they took the ideas uh, that were that were progressing of autonomy, diversity, and society, and created them what became equality, fraternity. I mean, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And to me, all three of those concepts are not. They cannot, should not, and do not exist. Mm-hmm. And and we need to rethink them. And now I've just done something that I always try not to do, which is state something that I'm against without having a whole entire book to back it up. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's so it's so hard when you are trying to put forth positive ways of dealing with ideas to, um, to get out of the dualistic oppositional mindset that, uh, that creates yeah. violence. And that's that's a trap that I think any of us who are trying to um, accommodate change and and make it a beautiful thing um, come up against. And you know when you attack people's deeply held principles, like mm-hmm. the truisms that they think that they've never questioned, mm-hmm. there is a lot of hostility. If you say things like like I have that democracy doesn't work, will not work, will never work, has never worked, and neither will communism, and neither does the trade economy, and, mm-hmm. you know, all of these things that are really cherished beliefs among both sides. Um, yeah, so like I said, liberty, equality, and fraternity, for me to tackle that will take another entire book, which it, a, a lot of what's going on in, um, just a second, I'm sorry, I'm just, I have to shut this off, but a lot of what's going on in, um, I apologize. It's okay. We're we're not uh, a big corporate uh, polish <laughs> entity, go. and we don't mind 
phones ringing and dogs barking. <laughs> yeah, well, we have dogs that bark. And... Yes, I forgot to turn that off. Okay. Um, okay, but with binding chaos, I mean, a great deal of that I'll leave for somebody else to develop on. But two things I do have to develop on is, one, binding chaos is sort of an overall sketch of a plot. And I do need to look at the tools. I, I really want to talk a lot about the tools that we're using since we don't have moats and mountains anymore. We have technological tools and government principles and laws and I need an entire book to talk about what we're doing with them and how they are um, being a coercive force on the way we interact and what could be improved but um, before that I really want to talk about the casting and um, who we are what roles we are forced into what roles we accept what roles we are born into um, because we are different people and we play different roles and different roles I mean the diversity is essential and to swap diversity for equality was not only a huge mistake, but it is, you know, prima facie completely ridiculous. We are not all equal. An infant is not equal. Um, you know, a person dying in a hospital is not equal to a person who's able-bodied in the, in the marketplace. And we really need to reconsider a lot of these truisms and start accommodating things differently. And for me, what we've done in the last few years was sort of a... Um, a transitory phase where we took all of our principles and we put them on new technology and see that just to see where what would happen and particularly two of my favorites are Twitter and Bitcoin because for me society and um, influence in society and the economy they're the same one and the same thing really mm -hmm. um, so Bitcoin we took the 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 principle of you know, I mean, really, people say Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. Yes, it is. And so is all economy. All currency is a Ponzi scheme, really. Mm -hmm. And so is all, all celebrity influence. Um, and Bitcoin, it took the economy that existed and just sort of fast-tracked it into this wide open space with no limits where we have instant Bitcoin billionaires and a very tiny population of them. And, um, you know, and it became a caricature of the real economy. And it was pretty hilarious caricature. And it, it can, you know, it's a good example of showing what everything that was wrong with what happens if you just let the economy go, which, you know, it, it took years to develop our regular economy into the Ponzi scheme it is, I mean, the visible Ponzi scheme it is today. But Bitcoin can do it in months. <laughs> well, I, I don't understand, first off, why everybody doesn't understand that money is, is made out of thin air by the banks mm -hmm. but secondly that money is an absurdity I mean the mm -hmm. way you you increase money is to take a number like let's say two and keep adding zeros to it mm -hmm. you know 20 is bigger 200 is bigger 2 million is bigger um, the more zeros you add the more nothing you add Mm -hmm. <laughs> the more supposedly you have. And that is just so bizarre that it's crazy to me that people don't see through with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's it's a tool of coercion. It's a, it's a tool. It's just a, um, it's a tool of empire so they didn't have to be there in, mm -hmm. you know, pre present with their guns, right? Right. Um, and... and that celebrity influence to me it, it is a form of currency and it is the form of currency we gravitate to when mm -hmm. regular currency isn't um, available so you see it an awful lot online and I talked a little bit in Binding Chaos about Twitter and clout and things like that and um, but again they're they're very much set up around the algorithms that we use in our governance today which is you know the rich get richer those who could buy the Bitcoin in the beginning which were, I mean, I had, I don't know for sure, but I am quite certain that there is no single mother of 12 in Mali who is unemployed or any, you know, Amazonian tribe that's been driven off their land. I don't think any of them have Bitcoin. It's the same oh, people. I'm sure they don't. <laughs> you know, it's the same people in Silicon Valley that were already billionaires, most of them, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, you know, I mean, not all of them. I know not all my friends use Bitcoin, so I shouldn't say that because I'm going to get... <laughs> but um but you know i mean 
it was not the population that needed Bitcoin did not level out anything is what I'm trying to say. You're talking you're talking somewhat over my head because I have no concept whatsoever of bitcoins. Well, I guess while the culture has been moving in that direction, we've been moving more towards towards time banking and towards considering everybody's hour as equal and you you know you give me an hour of this and and uh, mm-hmm. I give you credit for it, and with that credit, you can buy an hour of that from anybody in the system. Mm-hmm. Um, and time is, well, <laughs> time is an illusion too, but it's less of an illusion than money is. And um, at least at least it's a um, somewhat egalitarian form of, Yes, and but like I said, it 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 presumes that in an egalitarian form, one is um, just, and two is um, sustainable. And I think that both of those those are principles that they failed over and over and over again for a reason. Because we aren't equal. Because an infant doesn't have hours to donate, so somebody will have to look after the infant and the elderly person. And you know, and the the idea of equality. Um, I've heard people online explain that technically, too, that oh, once we had a peer-to-peer technical internet where everybody shared and then corporate influence came along and made some some areas of the internet more dominant, et cetera, et cetera, um, and we turned into this hierarchical server-based system. But really, what happened on the internet from the earliest days is exactly what happens in the microcosm of Twitter. When you have an equal platform of peers some will instantly become more equal Mm -hmm. you know like we all said oh check out google it's a wonderful search engine you wake up in the morning and google is the new evil empire Mm -hmm. we did that it had nothing to do with the economy or corporate influence we all told each other about google and built it out of thin air Mm -hmm. and we do we do the same in a little microcosm like twitter because the algorithms are set up so that you climb up you don't pull up um if you want to have followers on Twitter, you try to get somebody with a lot of followers to retweet you. And that, that, that's the structure of the algorithm. And um, then everybody will retweet you. I mean, it, when those people retweet you, you will get a lot more followers, and there's this instant hierarchy. And it, it's a, like Bitcoin. It's a funhouse mirror of celebrity influence in real life. In celebrity influence in real life, you had to persuade some Hollywood film or some government party or whatever to promote you up to that position. So it was a locked out environment and we didn't like that and we wanted equality and direct democracy where we could all do it. But what direct democracy does is we just do it way faster and create far more um, influential people than we ever dreamed of. We have Justin Bieber who created himself completely out of um, peer-to-peer promotion Mm -hmm. and he's now far huger than any record label ever dreamed of being. He can create superstars just by a couple of tweets, which, I mean, they certainly couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. And, same, you know, governance is being replaced by thought leaders that, you know, roam the earth with their little thoughts and um, have this giant influence and this giant platform just from peer promotion. So basically, like I said, it, it's like Bitcoin. It took the exact same thing we already do. The rich get richer, the powerful get more powerful. And it turned it into this rather hilarious cartoon version of what we already do. And hopefully people, I, I believe people can already see that it's, it's just completely ridiculous. And we need to rethink the whole um, it's interacting as equals like that. And, you know, and, and the idea that everybody interacts as equals and we're all autonomous and there's no coercion, it's completely false. We've never, there's always coercion, there's always been coercion. And until we recognize that there is coercion and start channeling it in a way that we want, we're not going to be able to produce intelligent results. Well, and parenting think, has coercion built into it. What does? I said parenting. Of course. Has coercion built into it. I mean, you can try not to be a terribly coercive parent, but the fact is that uh, while somebody's dependent on you, you um, you are influencing them um, more than anybody else is. And your society is influencing you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's interesting because, as I said, I was raised in, you know, when a lot of people tell me, oh, 
that's just the way the world works and this is this will never work. Well, I was raised in a society where a lot of the ideas in binding chaos did work. That was the way we functioned because it did not have the outside course of forces. Money was not a big um a big deal. It it didn't really buy you much. So people were uh, it was a very isolated village and people had to interact in a different way. And culturally it was very different as well. And when I was growing up the societal coercion was very, very, very strong that you respect your elders. Mm-hmm. You respect your elders, you serve your elders. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as though you were doing them a favor. You know, if somebody goes and visits their grandmother in mainstream North American society, they're considered, oh, well, how wonderful of you to think of them. That was not the way it was when I was growing up. If you visited an elder when I was growing up, they were doing you a favor. They certainly didn't feel like they owed you anything. Mm-hmm. If you brought them a lot and did a lot for them, you know, they would, in a, in a group, ask you to do something to prove to all the other adults there that you were a good girl and looked after your elders. And that was about all the thanks you were going to get. And it was just, you know, it was expected. It was a respect thing. And then when we come out to the mainstream society, the way we're, North American society is structured now, it's coercive in the exact opposite direction Where, you know, I mean, I remember when I was growing up, adults, you know, and and you absolutely could not question or insult an elder no matter what they did. They could be, you know, alcoholic, pedophile, whatever. You were not allowed to point that out. Mm -hmm. And if they ever did fail in some dramatic fashion, you would hear how it was because they were ashamed of their kids. It was because their daughter or their son had done something terrible and the parent had become so ashamed and that's why they drank or whatever. And now you hear the exact same thing for the kids. I mean, there's the huge pressure on mothers to do this extremely impossible nowadays, this impossible um, standard for, that mothers are supposed to attain in parenting, and parents in general, but mothers particularly. And if somebody does something wrong, I and mean, we look in the U.S. at the Newton massacre or the um, the Boston bombing, we know nothing about their families, we know nothing about their background, but we know it's the mother's fault. Mm-hmm. In bo- both those cases, in the media, instantly, it's the mother's fault. The child was parented wrong, which is the exact flip side of the way I was raised, where if a parent did anything wrong, it was the child's fault. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this societal coercion is extremely strong. And not recognizing it and not showing it, um, not recognizing it and talking about it and deciding where we want to go with it is just not helping us at all. So if the Internet and Bitcoins and so forth are not going to um, get us out of this paradigm, what uh, kinds of strategies and so forth do you believe are, in fact, going to free us from um, oligarchy? Well, like I said, we, I have... I really, it, it's, it's difficult because none of the work I do is paid and everything I do in, everything I wrote in Binding Chaos, I tried not to clutter it up with real life examples or anything, but everything I said is field tested in as many places and situations as I possibly could through human rights work and other activist work. So it's very, very time consuming, but I really need to write two other books and, and the next other book of who we are and the roles we play and how we, how these roles will interact it's pretty essential to address that because it's a huge topic. It's not as simple as it looks because, like I said, I think we need to rewind several hundred years here and take a look at where we went wrong. Several so, thousand years. Um, yeah. I really think we had an opportunity at the feudal system and we blew it, but or it was blown for us. But um, one of the things I, I saw this year that was very interesting is, you know, we've St. Nicholas at Christmas, it, um, we all know St. Nicholas was a man with no children that went around and gave to the needy anonymously, it, according to legend. But we have taken that idea and co-opted it and narrowed it into this little funnel where you only give to your own children or your own immediate family, which were obviously already going to benefit from anything you had. And we've completely you know, polluted and corrupted the idea. Mm-hmm. And anonymous around the world... Um, I've seen it come up everywhere in in South America, in um, this, in the states. Uh, they've taken the idea of Saint Nicholas for operations, and and they've they've expanded them to um, just helping the homeless and op safe winter and things like that. That it, it's 
in, in the little society that is the anonymous movement or the anonymous idea, they've changed it to be a coercive force to give to people who need it again. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, that's the principle that is being established again. And, um, you know, I mean, that, that's one way we need to do it is we need to say, no, we're done with this building giant, you know, seven digit Twitter accounts and Bitcoin billionaires and all that. And we have to create wealth by sharing. You get more credit by giving than you do by, by taking. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, how do we make those changes? How do we change the underlying memes that, um, that keep us in this structure? Um, I said that would be <laughs> that would be book three. <laughs> that would be book three. All right. Actually, we're thinking along the same lines. But. We really need to talk about who we are first, in my opinion, and I really need to somehow find time to write it because it's a big it's a big topic. But like I said, one of the things is like I said, approval economy. Like what we were talking about. I mean, it is ridiculous to pretend that we exist only in a trade economy. Um, that's where people who have something to trade exist and everybody else is left out. I, mm-hmm. as, um, and and the, the idea of peer-to-peer, which I said is just, to me, that's just um, a hackery term for libertarianism. It's, it's not any different whatsoever. It's just, it's the same idea that we're all equal and we can all, you know, a 25-year-old single person with no dependents is equal to a 90-year-old who has some fatal illness that he can't function, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just completely false supposition that we're de- dealing with here. Um, so I mean, we need to recognize that, first of all, and start thinking more about what tools we can create that are more about pulling people up than climbing up, so, so far as influence goes. Um, it's interesting because after watching years of Twitter and cloud and all these online tools implement things to their algorithm that create more and more celebrity, Twitter just came out with something, a, a, a new feature where it shows on your stream if you actually retweet somebody, which is a pulling up feature, you know, promoting other people that are not as necessarily as important as you. Right. And it's interesting. It's about the first thing that they've ever added that I've seen that isn't trying to create this tiny little oligarchy of celebrity influence. Hmm. Um, Bitcoin needs to... <laughs> Bitcoin, I don't know. Maybe we need an expiring currency or something like that, but only you have to give it away really quickly. I'm not sure. But, I mean, there's many ways we can... If we change the way we think, we'll start creating tools that way. Mm-hmm. It, but I think the tools we created, first of all, are just... Um, they mimic the society we live in, and they were useful to show just how ridiculous the society's algorithms are. And yet you seem to feel that, in fact, we are moving beyond the point where where these oligarchs control us. On your blog at uh, www.georgebc.com, one of the things you say is old authoritarian systems can no longer bind the natural chaos of a free society. Yes. Um, can you expand on that? Why can't they any longer? Well, um, because we aren't bound. The power of the crowds is, we, we can see it all over the place right now. And I mean, I mean, Obviously, a lot of that is rather hoping, <laughs> but um, even, like I said, we, we've created this fun house mirror of Bitcoin billionaires and um, Twitter celebrities, but we can, we can remove the influence really quickly, and we can see that, I, I really think this is the year you're going to see an awful lot of those type of Ponzi scheme um, things that we created in the last couple of years collapse, because um, you can already see it where people are more trying to create mesh networks of um, influence. And we need to, especially for one of the things I was talking about in the book about concentric circles of expertise and epistemic communities, one of the things that has really limited us for all these years is having um, people in positions of influence created by the majority, which the majority are not expert. And we we need to have... Um, 
we need to have epistemic communities that are promoted by their own circle with input from the outside. So not promoted by their own circle like we see in the Vatican and the Communist Party of China, Mm -hmm. but transparently, but still promoted by their own, um, the, the people knowledgeable to promote them. And that will also really change the oligarchies, I think, because a person who is extremely highly expert in a topic is not going to be a person who's well known and popular with mass humanity usually, mm-hmm. which is one of the reasons why these celebrity thought leaders, to me, is such a ridiculous creation. Because most people who are expertise experts in their field, they're in their labs, they're in their homes, they're doing whatever they're working at what it is they're expert at. They're not roaming around the world doing promoting themselves. Exactly, exactly. The people who have the time to promote themselves are not the people who are in the labs working. Mm-hmm. So that's why we need more of a um, of an epistemic community where they're peer promoted, but it obviously needs to be completely permeable and transparent as well. And I do think we're seeing that in some areas. Tell me about mesh ne- networks. Well, like I said we need to talk about the the um, the idea of equality before this is ever going to work. But um, a mesh network really it's what the internet was supposed to be, where everybody is equal and connected and we don't have these centralized points of control. And the internet was always intended to be that, just as democracy was always intended to be that, and communism was always intended to be that. We've tried many, many times to create this network where we're not looking up to one um, celebrity for influence. We are um, connected to each other, right? Mm -hmm. But we we need the tools that are going to promote pulling up instead of climbing up. What do you think, as you were talking about that, I was I was um, thinking about even some of the, you know, in science you have chaos theory, which basically says that everything affects everything else and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just curious in terms of, oh my God, I, I'm sorry, my brain is losing. <laughs> I forgot the question. I'll, I'll come back to it. Yeah, I'm sure it will, I'm sure it will return um, to, to you. Um, and Sorry about that. I feel well. Now, don't keep, don't keep apologizing. You uh, you know you have a condition which is affecting your short term memory, and that's just what is. And but it does tend to come back because you're a very evolutionary thinker. Um, how how does harmony and human rights evolve from chaos? With great care. <laughs> Um, we really, really need to care about human human rights individuals above the the greater good. Um, all of you know, we we need to get rid of the fear of others. The this, this locking into what are currently nationalistic, but any kind of really, really othering type of societies, and caring more about. Individual rights, like I said, I mean, again, that's what I want to talk about in the next book, but autonomy, diversity, and society, not liberty, equality, and fraternity. Because um, to me, I mean, the, the very idea, we don't all relate to each other on an equal basis in the first place. So, I mean, the idea of fraternity always turns into people that are like you. Yeah. Because we all, you know, if you go out onto the street the idea of a nation state full of people that are like you, they just aren't. I mean, even in my tiny little village where I was growing up, we were not all alike. We were not all equal. We did not all, you know, com- talk to each other as on, on the same level as we talked to everybody else. Um, but it, it, in, a, in a whole entire state, obviously this doesn't exist. You have your, your little societies that you belong to, and the society is not the same as a state. Um, and I, I think that's another really, really key thing that we need to do is we need to recognize those societies, those societies that we belong to and those societies that other people belong to so that we can figure out how we collaborate in between them and how we accommodate people whose principles are completely different than ours. And that is, again, that does not align with states like our governments would like us to believe it does. Um, you talk about Autonomy, diversity, and there's a third one in that list. Society. I'm sorry, society? Yes. 
Okay. Um, what do you mean by autonomy? Autonomy is human rights. It means it, it's what I talked about, I think, in one of the earlier chapters in the book about individual rights. Um, it's wrapping a person with the rights to achieve their full potential, to feel safe, to to have the human rights that they would be born with as any animal, the rights to collect food and, and you know, have a home and all those um, things. It's just individual, um, a holistic individual, one that's not being ripped apart and dependent and stripped naked by the society. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And one, a holistic individual that can change societies, one that is, I, I believe that we need to respect different societies and they need to have their own autonomy, each society. But above everything, above all of these interlocking societies that we have, we need to, to respect the right of individuals to leave that society and we need to respect um, the global commons. To me, those are the two paramount things that I try not to say we need to do this and we need to do that to anybody, but I don't see how any of this is going to work unless we respect individual rights and the global commons first. And within that, societies can do whatever they like. Okay. Tell us about the global commons and what you see it as. Um, I see it as something that supersedes humanity. Um, it's not the... It's... It, the, what do I define what aspects of the world do I put in the global commons or what is the concept? Both, but let's start with the concept, I think. Okay, the global commons is anything that if you affect it, you affect all of us, as in our oceans. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, as in our air, as in our water, as in our... Mm-hmm. So- I do not ascribe to the idea, which an awful lot of people do, that... Um, a lot of people that are promoting the idea of equality and we all are coming together. Um, I don't think that we all have to believe the same things. And I think there's an example in Binding Chaos where I think if people in the North want to have a seal hunt and people in the rest of the world find that absolutely repulsive, it doesn't affect them. It does affect the seals. They could find it repulsive. Their power is in a coercive force on the society of people up north, it, it through forms of shunning or whatever, but they don't have the right to say what goes on at that level. When it comes to things like drilling in the Arctic, we certainly do. Mm-hmm. And what's the why? Why do you make that difference between killing seals and drilling? Because we need to respect that not everybody has the exact same lines of right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I am a vegan and it's, you know, I don't, it's my personal principle, but I, I can't put that on everybody on earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, that goes for many, many things. And I, that's another reason that I really think that we need to look at dividing different societies according to principle instead of according to state. So we can look at the principles that people hold and what is different. And some of it is very shocking to people, you know, I mean, some people find that societies that eat dogs is very shocking. Other people find societies that eat cows is very shocking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what we need to define the principles, and that's something that definitely book three needs to talk about, how we define the principles and how we can relate to each other and how we can um, use trade agreements and whatever to talk about those principles. But you can't just have global principles and impose them on the whole world. That's just not going to work. Um Except, like I said, the things like the global commons and the individual rights, they just have to work because nothing else works without those two. But one of the things I was thinking of, one of the most extreme examples that I can come up with and that is really suitable to anything talking about um, online governance or the Internet is because it's definitely where the society lives, is um, what our society terms as pedophiles, which that is a society is not... Um, it's not one or two people that believe something and go off and do it all by themselves. It's very much a huge international network society of people that hold a principle that is not a principle commonly held by an outer society. Mm-hmm. And we do not recognize them as, um, as a society. We recognize them as deviants from, from regular society. And if they go too far, we put them in jail, et cetera, et cetera. But really they are a society and they have been for decades and decades, if not forever, um, 
they have their own culture, they have their own network, they have their own... Um, the, the pedophile information exchange in the 70s was extremely powerful. It had the, a, a huge amount of propaganda that it put everywhere. They, um, they've obviously, as we've seen with the BBC and the Vatican and soon to come many, many other places, they have occupied the positions that they need to occupy to set society the, the way that is beneficial for them. Um, their propaganda is absolutely everywhere. The very fact that we call them pedophiles instead of pedosadists um, the fact that we say child porn instead of child abuse, these are principles that were introduced and spread by that society. And, you know, because we don't recognize them as a separate society, we all use those, those same terms, which is ridiculous for people who don't agree that it's a pedophile, right? If you think it's a pedophilist, you would think you would say it was a pedophilist, but we don't. Um, and like I said, the, this society is in every aspect of every society that I have encountered worldwide. And they believe very, very firmly in their principles. Even, I mean, you can see that online because it, you get into arguments with them online very easily while you wouldn't on the street because they don't, you know, on, face-to-face, they recognize that they are a subversive society. Um, but if we separated that and we said, okay, you believe that there, as the Pedophile Information Exchange published that there should be no age of consent, as in zero. Anybody that believes in the principle that there should be no age of consent, stand over here and as a separate society. Then we would be perfectly within our rights if we said, no, we don't agree with you to shun that society and not trade with them or do whatever. And if we also had individual rights above all else, we could even come in and take individuals that we saw being abused. Mm-hmm. Um, and in and, and that way, you know, shunning in that case would be, okay, we're shunning you based on a principle that you as a fully um, powerful adult accepted as a principle. And, and that kind of shunning is perfectly acceptable to me. Shunning the way we do it now, as in we, sh- you know, the UN decides to shun North Korea, Iran, Cuba. This is collective punishment. This is a war crime. We have all agreed decades ago that collective punishment is a war crime. You can't say that a baby can't have medicine simply because they were born in Iran. That is, should be everybody's definition of evil, I would think. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I mean, a baby did not accept any principle and saying that a person is responsible for who they elected or what government doesn't like their government and starving them to death because of it. These are war crimes that we are watching here with this kind of shunning. It's not the same as shunning a society because they've accepted a principle in full knowledge that we have it. And also, if we had a society, like if we created a society and said pedosadists are over here and these are their principles and they agree with the pedophile information exchange principles, we could debate this. Like we could talk to them openly and say, start de- debating and educating rather than having a subversive society that is absolutely everywhere, but we don't acknowledge them unless they actually commit a crime and we... Cr- we um, you know, they're convicted of it. So, I mean, to me, that's another very important point is that we recognize that there is diversity, that we have different societies, that we accept different principles. And if this is a problem, then we can debate them and do whatever about them, right? Pedestatus is an extreme version. But, you know, we live in different societies all over the place right now. We have different families that all have different principles. We have different religions. We have different, some of us um, ascribe to certain cultures. But the idea that, Um, humanity has different races is genetically absurd and even culturally we're all um, now committed to this multinational corporate culture around the world that is telling us all how to dress and how to act and what media to listen to but um, but we do like we, we are not we are not actually all we don't actually all ascribe to the same principles and we don't we can't have them all placed on each other, we should have them recognized and debated. Knowing that, that we are not going to have very many universal values, how how do you create mass collaboration? Look, like I said, I, I think we do need to have two universal values, which is the global commons and individual rights. Mm-hmm. And what the individual rights are, as um, I discussed in Binding Chaos under the um, Beyond Nation States part, the where those individual rights stop and start, we're going to have to leave to each society 
to some extent because, um, you know, they're just too debatable. Um, but, yeah, I, I think those two principles, as a world, we have to agree that we have global commons and individual rights. And beyond that, we have to agree that there are um, varying principles of different societies and we have to accept those principles as individuals, as adults, not as just members of a geographical region that we are locked into and not allowed to leave. How do you reconcile um, diversity in society? Society suggesting that people need to approach certain norms in order to, um, to cohere and diversity suggesting that um, um, well, such concepts as that people with, we're going to be talking on Wednesday to somebody who feels strongly that people with substance abuse addictions um, are actually soul searchers are actually looking hard for um, something that is is highly worthwhile. It's just that they're looking in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. Um, how how do you um, accept the diversity, for instance, of these people who? Um, have gone astray and yet also honor society. Well, like I said, I mean, to a large extent, each society is going to have to decide that for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, the and, and again, like if people just kick drug addicts out of their societies and don't support them, that's where shunning from other societies would come in. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the idea of diversity, like I said, I, I really need an entire book to explain that because it's far bigger than I think most people accept that it is. Um, We've we've been living in in rather of a a, a tyranny of the average where the the majority rules that has has obliterated all opinions that aren't a majority, but there actually are a, a huge amount of them. And, you know, the person that you're talking to on Wednesday, I probably agree with a lot of their points just simply because there is an unstable um, instability at the far ends of the gene pool, both far ends, mm-hmm. which will um, will lead to self medication because it's difficult to deal with. But um, but yeah, it's like I said, each society has got to got to to a certain extent decide their own um, their own pra- I mean their own parameters and then it's up to other societies to just use coercive force on them right the way we would do right now except for um, what's an example I can think of I'm, I'm drawing blanks here but you know I mean right now if you look outside your door many people live in different societies right now and they have diversity they have the elderly people they have ch- children they have you know, they have their own issues like drug addiction, but they are still, they belong to, say, they are Christian or whatever. They belong to a certain church or um, a certain um, affinity group of some sort. If we look around, we can see how they're dealing with them right now. There is diversity in every society already. Did that, that remotely answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it it does. Um and I guess I'm not going to ask you for your definition of society because, again, that would take a whole book. Um, it's basically it's anybody that has agreed on certain principles or um, I did talk about it a bit in the Beyond Nation States mm-hmm. part. It's, it's, it's anybody who has agreed. We, we all belong to several interlocking societies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it can be any society that agrees on certain principles. And acts together on them. They said, I mean, um, Anonymous is acting as a society by reclaiming the idea of St. Nicholas and and um, just for that one particular thing they are, right? 
I guess before we leave, people that are listening are probably going to be interested in your relationship to WikiLeaks, how it developed, how it ended, and um, what what your critique of them is. Um, I don't I don't talk about um, WikiLeaks, but um, I can talk about my my work in those years. Um, really, like I said, I mean, I've always been, there, there's never been a time when injustice didn't bother me and I didn't have more hope for the future. For me, I saw when the collateral murder was released, um, the, the murder video was released and it went on YouTube. When I first saw it, there was an overwhelming emotional response that this had to be, this absolutely had to be the breakthrough moment that, you know, like that we were sitting there with an an entire mountain poised for an avalanche. And to me, this would be the rock. Mm -hmm. And um, I came back the next day to look at it again. And there were comments below the video that were absolutely, absolutely unbelievable to me. And, you know, I'm a jaded person. I live in, I work in human rights. I do not have a rosy vision of humanity, but I was absolutely, completely shocked. They had, you know, put it to dubstep. The the comments were absolutely horrific. And, you know, I was just really kind of devastated that what on earth was going to take to to start change. Mm -hmm. So when, by the time the... um, the Iraq war logs came out. I started blogging about it and trying to influence the, the online conversation surrounding the WikiLeaks releases, surrounding Chelsea Manning's um, releases specifically. Um, because I found, like, to me, that was a catalyst. Like, Chelsea Manning, her releases mm-hmm. were a catalyst that were going to do something or I was going to die trying. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I mean, I didn't want the rest of, of her work to go the way I saw the collateral murder video going, which later it gained momentum, but at the beginning it just did not have the effect that I expected. And so when the Iraq war logs came, I wanted to start, I wanted to push as hard as I possibly could. And I saw this giant, um, you know, we have, we have this Messiah thing in our society where we like to find any, any especially particularly western man that's going to lead us to the future and i saw this carry our cross for us yes and i saw this giant international interest and i'm all about voice amplification and how i can grab it for people who don't have it so i did Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know there's this giant amount of interest so and anything to do with wikileaks was um hugely popular so I created the news site and I started pulling up anybody that I felt needed to be promoted. I ran human rights stories on individuals. I ran everything I could about, you know, people that were completely unreported in my opinion. Like um, the African countries also had so many protests in 2011 and I tried to push them as hard as I could and went nowhere. Um, but Tunisia definitely, I grabbed as fast as, as, as fast as they started Tunileaks and promoted that. Um, and any of the others that came up that I, I, with, with the guiding principle of so long as they were adhering to human rights, which Libya blew on about day three. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you, you know, anybody that was adhering to, to human rights and trying to create change and was unheard, I tried to bring them up and use that megaphone to amplify them. And really, and, but the structure was always a transitory structure. It was never going to work because it's, you know, I mean, it was a highly centralized thing. It was a dictatorship, really, because of the um, of the nature of WikiLeaks and the people surrounding the movement. And it was it was it was almost layered like an onion. With um, I had I had to have complete control over it because it was legally liable for everything put on it. And there was so much, so many attempts to sabotage from the outside. And I had, you know, the domain was mine. Um, the legal liability was mine and Canadian legal liability for publishing is extreme. Um, So, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week that I didn't sleep for 2010 to 2012. Mm -hmm. And, you you know, like um, a a lot of the people were on there to write about WikiLeaks. So 
And that was what was driving the traffic, obviously. So, you know, you put those people to doing that and then use the amp- that amplification to bring up as many other people as I possibly could in the in the same space. But eventually it just became ridiculous. You know, you're you're using another person's name, which is, right. all, all, you know, obviously problematic. Mm-hmm. And it was a dictatorship. It was not the structure that I wanted to go with in the end and the legal liability and everything else. And so at that point, Twitter was able to do the same job for me a lot faster and a lot with a lot less effort. I can just retweet somebody instead of writing an article about them or doing an interview about them. And um, it's work, it works for me much better at this moment, but it, it also is transitory. And hopefully we'll move to something I'm hoping really soon, but it won't be. Um, Twitter itself is a problematic structure. It's a corporate controlled tool. It's centralized. It's censorable. Um, we need to move to a peer-to-peer structure for social media that has hopefully a completely different algorithms associated with it. And there's a lot of there's a lot of real potential there. But technologically, we're away from it. And you know, as a society, we're away from it. We haven't developed the algorithms we need to collaborate yet, anyway. So hopefully, we'll get there in the next couple of years to something that is much more close to being a final product that we can use. In the process of developing those algorithms. Um, to move us, transition us from the oligarchy of our dominant culture into functioning mass collaboration. What role do you see violence playing or even coercion? Well, they say coercion is one of those things that we're just going to have to accept that is present in every single, every single transaction and every single interaction that we have as a society. We need to accept that it exists and, um, channel it and and guide it appropriately um violence Mm -hmm. it's it's very what i think is um some people have this view of humanity that we are all inherently good which i actually i i I believe, despite the fact that I work in human rights, I believe that we have the potential to be inherently good. Sociopaths exist. Um, psychopaths exist. Mental illness exists. These, uh, we need to put more focus into... into um, I, I firmly believe that these are actual diseases, not... Um, I've actually a lot to do with those things, and I do believe that they are things, whether we can cure them or not, they um, they are deviations from the norm, and I do actually believe that they're actual illnesses that could probably be cured if we would put more focus onto them. Beyond that, I don't think, in, in a functioning person, I, I think we have an abhorrence to violence, naturally. Uh, it can be learned, it can be there by mental illness, it can be there for by drug abuse, it can be there for many things, but I think if we can con- somehow control those outside forces, we can eventually control violence. I don't believe violence has any appropriate role to play in coercion at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, there, is, there has to be a restraining factor until we get these things sorted, obviously, which is what shunning is, really. I mean, when you put somebody in jail, it is shunning. Like I said, when, when, when I talk about shunning and people say, well, that's not very effective, well, but where I was raised, shunning was a death sentence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, shunning is still what is practiced in prisons. And within prisons, if you misbehave, they put you in solitary, which is torture. Mm-hmm. If listeners are attracted enough to your proposal to want to act on it or to learn more about it, what do you propose their first steps should be? Um, they want to act on it, or do they want to talk to me about it, or what do they want okay. to do? <laughs> let's, let's separate those two questions. First off, if they want to talk to you about it, and then if they want to act upon it. Um, if they want to talk to me, I'm pretty Googleable. I think. Um, Twitter's the best place to talk to me. I'm, I'm difficult to get to answer by email. But I'm, I, I, I spend a lot of my time on Twitter now because it's one of my favorite tools to play with and see how, how we can figure out how things work. Um, if they want to act upon it, just think about how they're working. Um, a lot of people consider, I think a lot of people think that I have 
developed a new ideology or something like that, and its name is stigmagy, which it isn't. Um, for me, stigmagy is a method of collaboration that works in mass action-based systems, but there's obviously still completely a, a place for face-to-face consensus-based systems if you're working within your neighborhood, and there's um, idea-based systems that require expertise and epistemic communities and knowledge bridges. If they just think about those ideas and how they can apply them all to their own uh, own businesses, which I think an awful lot of people really have. I wrote Finding Chaos for the people that I work with, which is who I thought would be most interested in, and it was mostly an answer to their questions anyway, but it has been really quite remarkable the diverse audience that it has spread to, and a lot of people are using it as thinking about the way they work together, um, not software developers definitely, but really interesting other type of um, corporations and everything how to how to use stigmagy and these ideas within their within their structure that they're working with since you do all of this gratis how do you support yourself oh isn't that a lovely question that i'd love an answer to (laughs) (laughs) well you know i mean and people just say well you know you're just going to have to market yourself and you're just going to have to do because that's the way society works and uh, you know i don't think that is the way society works that's not the way this it's really hard I think it's particularly hard for me because another principle of where I was raised, you don't ask for money. Um, you share everything. Mm-hmm. It was very, very, um, you know, if somebody had money, that their first objective was to get rid of it and spread it um, in, in, a, in an ingenious variety of ways. You know, but, if, you know, if you had a cigarette, you passed it out to everybody. If you had a ordered a drink in the bar you bought for the bar and it would have been just really frowned upon to not do those things and you know if you came ho- home from a mine or something and you had a, a large paycheck you instantly started making highly improbable bets with everybody that you that you knew that was broke <laughs> so that you would lose right and you know when you're raised in a culture like that and I've I've seen this from a lot of my really older friends that were raised in China as well and places like that it's really awkward to live in a society where you're supposed to be constantly promoting yourself. Um, my inbox literally has almost daily people in it who say, I really like your work. I'd like to sign my name to it and market it for myself. <laughs> mm. And, you know, and what I put on the book is pay what you wish. And what the vast majority, almost unanimous amount of people wish to pay is absolutely nothing. Um, which is unfortunate, because I would far well, rather in position with with envision this, but that so I do I hear very much what you're saying. Um, so how do you keep a roof over your head and food in your belly? And... Yeah, I would rather. Um, to me, it's I would have rather just worked anonymously forever, which I did. I mean, even when I was working on WikiLeaks Central. Very few people actually knew I existed, much less what I did or anything else. And I've had to, over the years, come out more and more. There's, like, for Binding Chaos, there's a name attached to it. Um, There's a voice attached to it. There's a lot of opinions online that are from the same persona. But I find the the less information, the more people can just look at the data, and I prefer that. Um, People know that I'm Canadian. They know that I'm female. They know that... (laughs) Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I'd rather keep it down. Mm-hmm. What, what other uh, unrelated data were attached to those ideas? Mm. Well, this has been very informative. What else would you like to share with Envision This and our listening community before we uh, say thank you? Um, what else would I like to share? I'm sure there's something, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mary. That's, I have thought of it. That's quite all right. Um, yeah, I think if we had had uh, passed over anything utterly major to how it all fits together, that you would have uh, brought it up on your own anyway. Um, well, this has been a very interesting conversation. And it has. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both very much, and thank you for dealing with all your weather and getting back to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, it was spooky today. <laughs> and thank you to our listeners, and 
On Wednesday, we are going to be interviewing Ross Laird, who has a new book coming out, as I indicated, um, regarding um, addictions, but who I really felt affinity with because of his book, The Grain of Truth, where he talks about a handcraft, and in his case, woodwork, and how it becomes a spiritual practice and begins to shape your life. And I was very interested in that concept and how what we do in this world um, shapes our soul. And so I'm really looking forward to talking to Ross Laird uh, Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. If we have electricity. <laughs> if we have electricity, yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, Heather. Thank you both. Thanks, Heather. It was mm -hmm. great. Thank you. And have a good day. You too. Bye-bye.